Welcome. It's, it's fall 12. It's unbelievable. Even though we're into fall 13 in our offices already. Welcome to this semester. Uh, faculty, students, there are student government representatives here. You'll, you'll meet in a couple of minutes. And of course, our colleagues in the HEO series, who, have been, who, who this is not a welcome back for them. This is a thank you for them, because they've been here all summer, as many faculty have, but they taught in the summer sessions. So this is an exciting semester, another year. We have many, many students. We have almost 16,000 students, including our college now students. We have um, about 3,400 freshmen. And I had the pleasure of meeting many of them when they were here for their orientation just before school started. And uh, they seem to be a great, great group of students, very uh, pleased to be here. As you may have heard, we have uh, enrollment guidelines that, that we were following so that we didn't grow too much more. And so we were very careful about that. Our enrollment management team did a great job with it. Now, we also have many new colleagues, and I would like to welcome them. There are 76 new faculty this semester, including new, and, new lines and replacement lines. We have 55 substitute faculty among them and CLTs, and 21 new faculty who came, uh, were appointed as a result of searches. So now we have 378 full-time faculty and CLTs. In the last 10 years, our faculty has grown by 44%. It makes a difference in the lives of our students and certainly our colleagues and this community. Are there new faculty here? Yes, can you just stand? I won't, I won't put you on the spot. Welcome. Uh, the, as you can imagine, they are very, very talented because that's required to be part of our faculty, to be very, very talented. We also have new colleagues uh, on the HEO staff, and we're very pleased to welcome them. We have, uh, perhaps you may not be aware, um, we were able to hire faculty, but for the last uh, almost two years, it was very difficult to hire HEOs, and we had to give up two lines for everyone that we did try to hire. So it was a, a kind of a slog, but it was certainly worth it. And now we have new colleagues in the Bursar, in Business Services, in the Registrar's Office, in the Campus Learning Center, uh, Veterans Affairs. We have a new Veterans Counselor. Is, is Kevin here? Kevin Stevens? A wonderful addition. This is a very important initiative for a Veterans Resource Center. It's a partnership with Student Affairs and Academic Affairs and the faculty to make sure that our veterans those who've served in the military are uh, well shepherded through our, our very interesting process here. We also uh, are going to say goodbye and are saying goodbye to faculty who have retired this past year. Paul Azric, Jay Mullen, Jim Valentino, Jeff Kernett, Anne-Marie Bourbon, Michael Brzezinski, uh, Julia Ortez Griffin, Dave McCauley, Donald Tsang, Dave, oh, oops, Marty Jacobs, and Antonio Verdes. So they've all retired, and uh, we wish them all the best and hope to see them at some other events. So today I would like to share uh, some of what's been accomplished this summer and, the, and, of course, over the last year, and then also some of the things that we have ahead of us, which are always exciting. Uh, you'll also hear from Professor Alex Tarasco as chairperson of the Faculty Executive Committee on the newly revised governance plan. And you'll also hear some updates on the Freshman Academy, particularly the impact of high impact activities on student retention and performance. You'll also hear, that's from uh, Victor Ficarra and uh, Elizabeth Lachter in IR. And of course, we have to talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room, Pathways. And uh, Artie Corradetti and Lorena Ellis, who are our two co-chairs for Pathways Implementation, will uh, address that uh, toward the end of the morning. I would like to uh, introduce, for some of you who may not know, and I know with so many new people, it may be hard uh, to keep track of everybody. 
But I would like to acknowledge the governance leaders of this campus, beginning with our executive group, uh, Karen Steele, the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Karen has, uh, has been an amazing, amazing asset to everybody on this campus over the last number of years, but particularly this past year. She has uh, her team, uh, Deans Denise Ward, Artie Corradetti, Michelle Cuomo, Paul Marchese, uh, Bruce Naples, uh, there. And that's the Academic Affairs Executive Group. Thank you very much for all your work. In Student Affairs, of course, Vice President Ellen Hartigan. We, we introduced her as mom when we introduced her to students. Um, and also uh, Dean Paul Jean-Pierre, who is uh, the Associate Dean in Student Affairs. Vice President, <laughs> Vice President Rosemary Zins from Institutional Advancement. And she helps us in so many ways with uh, gaining some support from external supporters, legislators, grants, et cetera. Dean Liza Larios, who oversees human resources and, and labor relations and personnel. <laughs> Vice President Sherry Newcomb, Finance and Administration, who manages to keep us in the black. <laughs> With her, her team is uh, uh, Bill Faulkner, Arthur Perkins, and George Sherman, also all serving the business and administrative services. And I'd like to introduce Alex Burnett, who joined us a number of months ago. He's our Executive Director of Communications and External Affairs. As you know, we stole him from uh, Columbia's uh, School of International Relations, Relations, and actually Fox News as well. Alex has been doing a lot of work with the ACC, with Dave Moretti, on the website. You're going to see changes. They've been evolving. Uh, he also is working on, on better ways to communicate the great accomplishments of our faculty, our students, and our staff. So do look at the website. Uh, offer your comments to Alex uh, and his team. Alice and, and his team is wonderful. Uh, I don't think any of us would be, uh, in your case, sitting here, me standing here, without uh, what really is the backbone of our faculty and our leadership here, the academic chairs. They are unbelievably uh, supportive of our faculty. They advocate. They have to put up with me. And I want to thank you. There, there are lots of you, but if you wave, we have 16 academic department chairpersons. Thank you. They are. They are amazing. Uh, they, they're on 24-7, and, and that's... Uh, it's really very much appreciated. Uh, among them is a new department chairperson just elected last week. Dr. Regina Rocheford is now the chairperson of basic educational skills. And we want to welcome her. She couldn't be with us today for a family emergency. But we do want to welcome her. You'll see, I'm sure, more of her in other meetings. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, J uh, Jelani Warsi for his work uh, as chair prior to this. We have several governance groups who are elected, in addition to the elected chairs, we have several governance groups that are elected by, in this case, the faculty as a whole. And that is the Faculty Executive Committee. This is a group of faculty who's, who devote a great deal of time to uh, ensure that, that the voice of faculty is certainly heard. Alex Tarasco is the chairperson. <laughs> Wilma Anthony, Joe Bertarelli, Anne-Marie Bourbon, Nathan Chow, Tony Colios, and Philip Pecorino. And that uh, is a wonderful group of, of your colleagues. And that election, as you know, takes place in the spring. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful asset, again, to our institution. The Academic Senate is an important body representing um, faculty, administrators, students. And the Academic Senate Steering Committee is led by Dr. Emily Tai. Peter Bales, Lana Zinger, you are, right? Bell Birchfield, and Shannon Kincaid is the parliamentarian. And then, of course, we have another group of colleagues who serve as the chapter uh, officials, if you will, for the, faculty, uh, the PSC, which is the Professional Staff Con uh, Congress Conference, excuse me. Judy Barbanel is the chapter chair, Joel Kuzai, Mike Cesarano, and Phil Pecorino.
This, um, this institution by tradition is, is really led uh, by faculty. So many initiatives are carried by them. And I have to thank the faculty development and project leaders who have given enormous time with great results. The Freshman Academy faculty coordinators, um, and there, there are lots of them, but I'm gonna name them because they really do work hard. Shelley Bannon, uh, Renee Rod in the education group, uh, Alex Tarasco works with the Health Academy, Jody Childers, David Rothman, uh, Jenny Lee, uh, and Rosemary Akis, Bob Cooper, Moni Chalra, and Melanie Seaman all work with the freshman academies, and they are kind of a bridge between the students and the faculty, and they are wonderful in making our students, especially our new freshmen, feel so welcome. You're gonna hear about high impact activities from, from Victor and Elizabeth. They really have made an enormous impact on, uh, on student performance. And again, these strategies are led by faculty and as they've been adopted across the campus, it's been an amazing, an amazing kind of outcome. Uh, Kiki Bias works with learning uh, communities and we have now what's called SWIG, which Victor will explain, which is a combination. And Anita Ferdense is working on ePortfolio and Cornerstone Reform. Service learning has been an extraordinary effort and it seems to have taken root, not just here, but we're being acknowledged for our success with it all over the country. Dr. Sharon Ellerton, along with Joe Pantaleo, coordinated Dr. Ellerton just received a CUNY Community College Collaborative Incentive Research Grant. It's called a C3IRG, it's wonderful. This is a work on across CUNY collaboration to assess the impact of service learning on community college students. It's a great acknowledgement of Queensborough and the work of our faculty. Another high impact activity is, is, is writing intensive. And Megan Elias, John Talbert, and Jeff Junkowski, and Kostas Trombakis have been faculty leading that across disciplines. Very, very important. And again, uh, it has had an impact. As you know, WI is a, a graduate, we've adopted it as a graduation requirement to have two experiences. And that has been very successful uh, only because the faculty have, have really made it their business to be trained, be certified, and make sure that students have every opportunity for that. We have an honors program, uh, which we developed many, many years ago, and Paris Varnos helps us with that. He's the coordinator, he's done a great job. And as we are primarily a teaching institution, we value, obviously, teaching, it's our mission. But we also, since we have such talented folks here, are engaged in incredibly important research. And Raj Subarani is uh, from biology, is the coordinator for the responsible conduct of research, and that is, um, very important to all of us because new regulations will require compliance and, and she is certainly expert and will be a great leader for that. We have uh, also e-learning mentors uh, and just amazing. Our, our effort at, at e-learning is not all that old. As you may know, we've offered institutes in June or January for the last number of years and our faculty and including adjuncts have participated. The team is led by Bruce Naples, uh, and it's a great team. Donna Baccio, Phil Pecorino, Ed Balchik, Cheryl Bluestone, Lorena Ellis, and Melanie Seaman. What, as of this fall, there are 24 fully online sections at Queensboro, and 86 hybrid courses. Uh, so now we have 110 sections running. This is really quite an astounding growth because we didn't have very many a few years ago. We expect another 12 sections. Is that the pizza? <laughs> we expect another 12 sections for the spring. This is a great initiative, and I applaud, again, all those who participated. It's, it's an ongoing effort. It's the institute itself and a mentorship program, and I, I do admire folks who do it since I can barely turn my computer on. Uh, we believe very strongly in supporting all of these activities and, and we tried very hard, especially in terms of supporting faculty and staff to present the outcomes of their work, their research, uh, especially in pedagogy. So we have a number of resources and I wanna make you all aware of it. The Office of Academic Affairs sponsors pedagogical research challenge grants of, uh, totaling $30,000 each year and I hope you'll consider uh, applying for one of those. Again, Office of Academic Affairs has set aside $100,000 uh, 
uh, for faculty and HEOs to make their presentations at national conferences and international conferences. And our foundation, and, and probably most of you don't know, but we have a foundation. It's called the QCC Fund. It's a philanthropic fund. They raise uh, monies for us for student scholarships, for the Holocaust, the Kupperberg Holocaust Resource Center, for the art gallery. And they also support faculty research. Uh, they allocate $25,000 a year. So that is also uh, something that supports faculty and HEOs presenting their research uh, projects. And that is administered, again, through the Office of Academic Affairs. And of course, there is the contractual PSC CUNY travel monies. Uh, it's done by a per head, if you will, formula. And that gives us another $43,516 this year. So there's a fair bit of money which is available to support faculty uh, presentations. It's been invaluable because so many of our faculty have made Queensborough known, certainly across this country. So it's, it's very spectacular. I hope you will take advantage of these opportunities. We have some summer news and accomplishments. It's very exciting. We, we are a tobacco-free campus. It, it's, uh, it was something I think we all had a little bit of fear about. But as of the first day of class, we were officially tobacco free. And that, that means you have to go to another zip code to smoke. Uh, <laughs> folks have been, uh, it's a very, you know, it really is a very difficult thing to give up when you're a, kind of a smoker. And people have been very uh, respectful of, of the policy. And, and that means students and faculty and visitors and staff and everybody. And I want to thank the community, because it's our effort, I think, that as a community that, that helps people understand, if they need to understand, that we're in, in place here. So, um, so far, so good. Of course, it hasn't really snowed yet. <laughs> it's rained a little. I watched out for that. But we have been remarkably, I shouldn't jinx it, incident free. So there are a number of resources if, if people are interested in learning more about it. or trying to stop smoking, please do take advantage of our resources. We have a website. You can imagine everything is on there. It's wonderful. Um, also in August, we received welcome news. As of this coming January, the Q30 will come to Queensboro. This has taken a long, you know, it took about 30 years for the Q27 to come to Queensboro. So but by comparison, uh, this is a fast track kind of decision. We're very pleased. I'm not sure how, how close they'll come in. I don't think they can come into our depot, but we're probably right outside the campus on 56th Avenue. I think that will make a difference in, in many, in the travel lives of many people. Uh, you may know that CUNY first we served as a vanguard along with Queens College. Uh, that began, oh my gosh, almost what, four or five years ago, and it's been, it's been quite an interesting adventure. This summer, we were asked, again, to be the vanguard for the student financials, the billing aspect of financial aid. But this time, we were going alone, because apparently it was determined that only Queensboro had the strength to do this, and uh, it took a lot of strength. It's, um, it was huge. It, what it meant was, you know, we had to make sure that accurately the student uh, financial aid was, was reflected on the bill, uh, the bills were correct. Uh, it was beyond stressful. It was another summer of not just four day, but five days, six days, six days, and sick days, I think, too, for many, many people. I have to thank the enrollment management team, but particularly uh, the financial services team, uh, Ronnie Lucas and financial aid. Basically, where, Ronnie, are you here? She's still working. Here she is. Um, every time she left the campus to go to a meeting, I was afraid they'd never let her back here because they really they wanted her at the university center for this. Uh, but but you did both. Somehow you did both, as did so many other people this summer. Our business services staff for another module for CUNY First. There's an e-procurement. I love it. And uh, that is being implemented. That was done by our business services staff over the summer. And the summer for them is really busy. They have closeouts. They have auditors. We are audited by the state, the city, the university. And so that was a huge endeavor on top of their regular workload to implement uh, the e-procurement. And I really want to thank the budget staff. They led this. Uh, thank you under the leadership of Bill Faulkner and Sherry. Uh, so 
in case we have any money, we'll be able to spend it, which is kind of nice. So thank you for that. For the third year, uh, we offered summer scholarships. Students in our fall class, the freshman academies, who were within three credits of completing 30 credits in their first year, because our goal obviously is to accelerate, they were offered an opportunity for a free summer class at Queensborough. And because we wanted them to reach the milestone of halfway through their degree in one, one calendar year. And Michelle Cuomo, Michelle, where are you? An unsung heroine, Michelle. She really, uh, in addition to all the, the work on the freshman academies with student affairs, she also took on uh, the outreach and the screening of students who uh, want, were interested in a free summer course here. 76 students took a course this summer for free at Queensboro. 91% completion rate with an average GPA of 3.66. That really is good. And it's, um, we support that, by the way, through, through our partnership with Barnes & Noble. Through, you know, as you know, they are our campus bookstore. And that money, that's how we fund it. And it's really a wonderful opportunity for students. And I think it's growing, obviously. Michelle does a great deal of work. These students are interviewed, and they have to obviously, they are committed, as you can see, from the outcome. It's just kind of wonderful. Other news over the summer, we're so excited. We received the official letter from the National League of Nursing Accreditation Commission, awarding our nursing program full eight-year reaccreditation with commendation for excellence in meeting all of the standards. And So I, again, thank, congratulations to the colleagues in the nursing department. They worked for over two years on this. As you can imagine, any kind of external review, it does not happen open, not overnight. And they, they worked very, very hard on this, and I thank them. A couple of years ago, two years ago, Queensborough was chosen as one of 12 colleges nationally uh, by the Association of American Colleges and Universities uh, to lead uh, developing community college student road map, map for, for increased student retention and performance. It was awarded, uh, we received a grant, and it's been successful. It's supported the freshman academies and the high impact activities. And we just received word now that uh, Queensborough has been asked by the American Association of Colleges and Universities to serve as a mentor college for a new cohort of roadmap map colleges across the country. So I'm, I'm really proud, I think, of all the work that has gone into this. And again, congratulate the faculty and staff who, who have really made this the success it is. So thank you. As of this summer, we officially welcome the Department of Engineering Technology colleagues. Now, the board officially approved the merger of the uh, ECET and MTDD departments uh, this past June, and their faculty who are with faculty, CLTs, and staff 30 strong are now all located in the technology building. So I hope we'll all go over and say hello to them. I think we, you need an open house, Professor Asser. So they're just settling in. And it's a good thing they're just settling in because they're in the middle of ABET, which is um, attack of ABET accreditation. And uh, Stu Asser and Nick DeZinno and Bell Birchfield are leading that. That, too, has been ongoing for a number of, or at least a year, and will continue for a number of months. So we uh, appreciate that work. And I know you'll all hold their hands and give them sympathy, because it's a tough thing to go through. Speaking of new facilities, uh, our buildings and ground staff have been working really seven days a week to complete a number of improvements in partnership with campus facilities. So the ACC has helped, too, because they have to help us with some technology. And Joe Cardellano and Arthur Perkins have really just led an extraordinary effort. You may see some of the work. Some of it's very, very obvious. Other, others you have to know is infrastructure. Uh, but I've seen where other schools, ta it takes them years and millions of dollars with outside contractors to do this kind of work. So in addition to, of course, the faculty offices, we had to rearrange things for the new engineering technology faculty offices. We created uh, office staff for new colleagues in English and in math, ASAP, CUNY START, the Campus Learning Center. We added three tech, tech flex classrooms through a configuration, all of this through a configure, reconfiguration of space. Um, over 17,000 square feet has been repurposed in the last year or so. It's amazing uh, what we can do when we start looking around at spaces. 
Um, you may have seen the new Registrar Welcome Center. It's, it's still, we're still doing you know, the punch list items, but our registrar staff is now beautifully ensconced, and I, we've tried to create an environment in the lobby of the administration building uh, for our students to make them feel welcome. CEDL, we did a multimedia faculty uh, development facility. It's really wonderful. Uh, we actually, the year before this past year, we received, uh, God help us, bonus money because we did so well. I haven't heard anything yet about this year. I have to ask if we're getting more money. But with that bonus money, we created this lab for faculty development. It's a beautiful lab. It's uh, adjacent to CEDL. It's part of their suite. So I hope you'll take advantage of it. We do a number of faculty development activities and faculty research, and, and you're certainly welcome uh, to take advantage of that. There have also been renovations in our major lecture halls. You can see this one. Um, I'm holding my breath because we were asking people not to eat and drink in here, but this morning it was hard. Uh, the library, the library, the lecture halls in uh, Science Building are both completely redone, and they look, I think, amazing. I don't know if you've seen them, new seating, new carpeting, et cetera, and it's very important. Um, we've added 11 additional multimedia podium rooms this summer, and so now we have um, 75 classrooms, an additional 10 are planned for this year. And the current uh, number, 75, plus uh, about 24 teaching uh, technology spaces that are affiliated with the department. So now we have 99 uh, high-tech rooms or tech rooms with technology. I think it's really a, a great accomplishment. We have more to, to do, but it's, this is all being done by Buildings and Grounds this summer. It, if you really do, if you see them, you have to say thank you. It's wonderful. Our colleagues in engineering technology, Jerry Sippen and Mike Metaxas, created uh, a version of KidCar, which is, guys, make sure I got this right, keyboard initiated camera disabler auto reactivator, which is really their patented device so faculty can control the security cameras that are focused on um, the equipment. Not on the faculty, but on the equipment. And they also did an operations manual, and they have something that can go on the podium podium so that people can know how to, to turn it on and off, which is very good. Now, one project that our BNG uh, staff can't accomplish alone is a long planned capital project to create a new dining area and cafeteria uh, adjacent in, inside the science building cafeteria and where the current science cafeteria is. We've had this dream for probably eight years or more. Capital projects take a very, very long time, and we have gone uh, annually to our legislators, the city council, we've gone up to Albany, the state legislators, we've gone to the borough president. They've all been supportive of this. It is an enormous project. It will, at its end, with inflation, God help us, it's, it's now estimated at $20 million, and we hope to do start the first phase this summer. This is... Um, it will end up at the end, and we're going to show you a little bit about it now. It will end up with the courtyard being turned into a, a dining space. Informally, for, for our students, our campus community, our faculty and staff, it will accommodate 500. But our goal was also to create an op a venue for formal events, and so we can have a sit-down dinner for 450, which is very important. Uh, the project is being done in several phases. As I mentioned, the first phase will be this summer. We will end up with uh, a, a renovated serving area and a cooking area. You may know that much of the food is cooked across the campus and wheeled on those little carts. So at the end of this, that will all be in one building. Uh, the building also, the project will also give us another elevator in science, which is part of the first phase, very needed. It's a big building and it's very needed. So we kind of wanted to give you a sneak preview of the concept of what this okay. will look like. This is the front of the science building. And the only thing that changes here will be the signage. And then as you approach, you can begin to see there's a sloping um, access created to the space and some opportunities for new lighted signage over here. And the signage you can see a little, in a little more detail here. These are. Um, guided areas with opportunity for signage. This is an opportunity for lighted signage. You can begin to see the interior of the space and 
This is one entry to the space. And another. Again, this is, these are light panels that you can put um, signage on and then they, they will be illuminated from behind. And all of this, um, you can see the atrium here. That's all an all new roofing material that will lead into this new science courtyard. The first phase, by the way, will dome the courtyard. And you we'll can add, now. You can yep. see it. We'll add, uh, I know this is, architects are supposed to do the software, so I mean, <laughs> Sherry, God bless you. She, she's an attorney, she's not an architect. And the dome is made up of this phenomenal material which will go above the, reach past the second floor of the science building, right there. And it has a, a water collection system to be able to water what we plant as a green wall. You can see the little thing with the green. That is going to be a green right wall. And uh, the dome itself is, is very light. It's a multi-layered kind of effect. Um, it's, I think, quite stunning. You can see this is set up for the formal dining. It's, this area will be, of course, ADA compliant in terms of ramps, et cetera. Can you get an overhead, Sherry, on that? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Let me try that. The, the first phase, as I say, will dome it. And so the wall that faces the major, the pedestrian wall, if you will, is not, it's not part of the uh, first phase. But you can see that it will have uh, a dais will be able to have smart technology in it uh, behind. This is sort of a view from a, a window uh, up on the second floor or the third okay, floor. Okay, math department. Now you can't get distracted. You have to do <laughs> the third this. floor. Right. Uh -huh. And so you can here see, you're looking from up above. Right. The green wall, behind the green wall, will be another space that can be used for and that's dining here events. that's behind the green wall. Right. And on the right, which this is behind the green wall, there will be some storage areas so we can take tables and set tables up, different uh, layouts. It's behind the dais. And then looking out. So it's, um, I think it'll be very exciting. Um, the good news is they're gonna start next summer if everything goes well. The bad news is it's gonna make a mess. <laughs> so I just wanna prepare you. But as you can see, I think it will be worth it. This is uh, something that's very important. And even without the final enclosure, which is part of phase two, because it's in, you know, there's the dome and it's enclosed on three sides, this will probably be able to be used initially for uh, almost the entire year. And you the can second, see, yeah, the enclosure will go in this area eventually. So, so this is, the bathrooms are being all renovated and we're adding bathrooms. They are, they're kind of going to be, or they will be where the science. Uh, bathrooms will be over in this over area, here. over right. here. We know they're, where S111, S112, those bathrooms. Well, we're adding it, so they're, I think they're like 12, they're going to be 12 uh, stations yep. or something. You'll be able to access the bathrooms from the courtyard as well as from the science building. Right, and the elevator, the, the new elevator is in that corner. The new elevator right. will be here. And you can see the um, lighting features with these, this globe lighting and the fans, these large fans that um, will circulate air. It's a very environmentally friendly project. And the doming material is made, is inflatable. And that in, inflation and deflation helps to re, will help to regulate the temperature in the room and in addition with the fans. And eventually the, uh, in-floor heating will be utilized once the space is enclosed in the next phase. So it's going to be very, very exciting. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, what they call a, a seating area, le the ledges and, and outlets for people to power up laptops or whatever they need to do. So this is set up, as I said, for formal uh, dining, but informally it will have tables, but more in a more casual way, and we expect that it will be a wonderful space, obviously, for uh, assembly, if you will, but also for the dining, and, and uh, I'm certainly grateful for that. This campus was built for 5,000 people, so we, we really never had uh, proper dining, and, and this is very, very important. The green wall is this interesting material, and we, we hope that we'll have these climbing vines and things, uh, as I say, the collection, the water collection from the roof will water them. 
And uh, we are trying to be, and everybody is very sensitive to environmental uh, issues. Because it's a retrofit, we're not expecting we're going to achieve LEED certification, but we will be very conscious of that as we proceed. So those fans are, uh, they, they're expected to be something like 18 feet in span. I mean, it's a very big area. And it's, it's just wonderful. Uh, we're very, very excited. Now, of course, in the end, there was, a few things might be tweaked, but this is, this is where we're going, and we're getting ready to bid the project. This is uh, done through uh, the Dormitory Authority of the State of New York, of course, and CUNY and Queensboro. So you'll begin, uh, I'll certainly keep you informed. Did you mention the seating number? I didn't. Yep. Yeah. 450 formally at the sit down dinner and about 500 in casual seating. Yep. Should be very, very nice. So now, Preston and all the student government, you're going to graduate because first, I mean, don't stay to see it finished. <laughs> right. Come back and work here or something. That would be good. Okay. So this is wonderful. This is, as I say, it's been, it's been a long, long time. We have a couple of other capital projects, uh, which have, again take a long, long time. The design uh, of, of all new doors uh, for the exterior doors for all the buildings with the central locking system. Uh, and that, that has been in design for, oh gosh, four or five years. It, it's just a very lengthy pro, uh, program and process, which is all the more reason why I think our building's grant staff is kind of amazing, because they do things fast. And I always tease them, because the prices are very expensive of these things. So we seem to do it much more efficiently, but we could never do this on our own. So it's going to be wonderful, and uh, I look forward to it. Thank you for that. Now, this semester, we did launch uh, the QCC1 card. Students got them first, right? You have them. And you may have heard about it. We're going to be rolling them out to faculty probably next month. There they are. They are smart cards. Uh, they will do a number of things. They will allow students to, they can be used in dining facilities on campus, um, on the machines, what do you call those machines? Vending machines, in the library, et cetera. Uh, faculty will get them, as I said, faculty and staff in October. We just had so many students to try to turn over, we, we wanted to kind of digest it. Sherry Newcomb led this effort. It's really, it's going to be amazing. I think it's wonderful. It's an advantageous for students because if they choose within the one card to put uh, money on from their financial aid or their own money, they can create an account within the card and that will allow them to buy food at Met Foods on campus. At, without having to pay tax because it's legally considered a meal plan. So it saves students, what, almost 9%? What is, what is New York now? Eight, eight and three quarters? That's a lot of money, which is a good thing. So I think that's, that's a good thing. And there'll be bonus uh, you know, incentive programs, et cetera, so that's kind of nice. Uh, our new degree program, the dual joint program with John Jay and Forensic Accounting is effective this fall, another piece of good news. And pending uh, our own campus and university action, we expect the, another dual joint program in nursing to be approved, this time with York. And I understand there's another one in the works with another senior college partner. Very important, and it's wonderful. Um, last year, Queensboro and the Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives were awarded uh, a prestigious NEH grant, National Endowment for the Humanities grant. Again, it was only one of six community colleges in the nation to receive this grant. It's uh, integrating cultural resources into the humanities curriculum. We do so much research in the sciences and STEM that this was an incredible breakthrough. Uh, it is a series, a five-year series of colloquia. It's to engage faculty and students in the humanities and the study of humanities. Colloquia team, uh, themes will change annually based on a competitive proposal submission process among our faculty. In this, the inaugural year, the theme is Human Rights, Je Justice, and Genocide. It's under the direction of Dr. Sarah Danielson from our history department. And this will be a series of events uh, directed to scholars, educators, students, and the community at large. The program actually begins today, and so Dr. Tai is going to run out because she's, she, we want to get there and, and support uh, this launch event, which is at the Grad Center. This is a Queensboro project. Uh, and it, most of the events will be held here, but it is a prestigious launch. And I have to thank Dr. Tai because she worked with Arthur Fug and the Holocaust Center uh, to really make this a competitive proposal. 
it was uh, a labor of love over many, many, many months, and it, I think it's been enormously important to us. Now, we have uh, an Academic Senate Committee on, on uh, archival resources, cultural and archival resources, and they've been a partner in making sure that uh, faculty have access to different kinds of materials for their classes, and they will partner on this as well. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lazul, are you here? There you are. So uh, Dr. Lazul and her committee has been working on this as well. I, I hope you take advantage of it. I understand they're posted on, right, on the web, different uh, materials and ideas for lesson plans, et cetera. So, of course, we're here, and our primary mission is to, to work with students and teach. Um, and I want to introduce our student government leaders. They were elected, uh, as you know, in the spring. Great turnout for the election. We have, I think all of you are brand new in the sense that you weren't on the board last year. There you go. You want to just stand up and wave hello to everybody? Here they are. It's really wonderful. You know, students are our partners in many, of, many activities, including uh, what we do during this year we're about to launch, which is our strategic planning process. Uh, that is really uh, an effort to focus our priorities as an institution. The primary group is um, the College Advisory Planning Committee, which includes the governance leaders, representatives from the Senate, the Faculty Executive Committee, administrators, and students. And what we do is say, OK, these are the things that are important to us, and these are the ways we're going to accomplish them. That process to determine our priorities takes most of the year. Many of you are aware of it. The committee works and develops uh, ideas and proposals. And the university has set a series of, of major goals. And all colleges kind of interpret how they will be accomplished locally. And so that launch will begin. This year, the, the, what we're doing now is, of course, implementing the fiscal year 12 strategic plan. We're awaiting the final approval for all the things that we want to do. It takes us, again, from goals to objectives to activities. And again, all, all of our community members are involved with this effort, whether you're on the faculty or the administration or students. All of us contribute and support this effort. And so I encourage all of you to become aware of the strategic planning process to give your voice in terms of suggestions and, and observations to the College Advisory Planning Committee, to anyone who's involved with shepherding it through. We do have uh, open fora at, at the end of the session, but we do meet with individual constituencies to kind of get their, their interest in priorities, and, and we incorporate, as best we can, all of the things that are important. The strategic planning process is important because it, it basically directs how we invest our resources. So from a financial point of view, if something is really not in the strategic plan, it's not high up there to get funded. So you have to be in it to win it, as they say. And it's, it's wonderful because so far, we're OK on our budget. That, again, is because we have a strong enrollment. We have strong revenue. We have been very smart about enterprise money and, and leveraging all the things, that resources that we can. But if we are in a situation where we're in a difficult contraction, and you know we, we've had those over the course of the years, because we have our priorities in place, we kind of know what's going to be our main goal. And that, so it helps us in good times and bad times. And it's only as good as, as all of us putting our, our thoughts into it. So please do focus on that. That's our big process that goes along year round. One of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to describe to you some of the accomplishments is that we have um, uh, a huge effort underway now with Pathways. And it, it is consuming a great deal of time. It's consuming a great deal of energy. And it is very, very important. But what we do here is, is will we'll remain uh, after we get through whatever we get through with Pathways. It is important that we keep our eye on our main mission, that we celebrate the things uh, that we've done so very well here at home, and that we keep going. And each year, the chancellery evaluates how we've done. And that's called a completion report. And that completion report is on the web, right, for this year. 
So you'll get to see how, what we said we were going to do and how we did, whether we met our uh, objectives. It's very important. And, and the chancellor meets with each president. And we had our meeting uh, in August. And he wrote his letter, which he usually does to a president. He was very, very complimentary of our faculty for its accomplishments and its research, uh, the excellence of teaching. He was very complimentary about so many things that we do here. There were things, as with every, as you can imagine, it's not always 100% perfect. And he has asked that we redouble our efforts to improve the outcomes for remediation. This remains uh, just such a difficult challenge. It is very, very important. If you're in a department that offers remedial courses, that's mathematics and basic educational skills, I know that this is, uh, consumes you in terms of your, your conversations and the work that the departments do. But all the rest of us receive students from those departments, those remedial courses. So we all have a stake in remediation and hopefully the improvement of outcomes. It's not easy, uh, and we have to make a difference. It's just, it is not trending well. We just don't seem to be able to get past um, uh, the, the point where we were. We actually went down in our success rates in reading, writing, and mathematics. It's a real concern. And there are many things that are perhaps beyond our control. But the reality is we have to do something to address it, because all of us rely on very strong student skills and preparation. And so you're, you all, in math and basic skills, are the front lines. So we'll be working with you. We'll support whatever we can to help you with innovations. As a matter of fact, the math department, Dr. Fabricant, and uh, several of our colleagues in math were invited to the university today to present some of their ideas. They've been working very hard on innovations. So we're very proud of the fact that uh, we can offer something uh, to the university. But we really have to improve uh, the outcomes of remediation. So that remains a huge effort coming forward. This year, coming year, we're also going to do program review in liberal arts. It will have a, a, a small team of faculty will partner on the self-study of the liberal arts degree program. It's very timely for many reasons. As you know, we look at programs internally over the course of a five-year cycle. And this year, liberal arts is up, which is our largest program. There were over 5,300 students enrolled in, in liberal arts. It's, it's a huge program. It's, as you can imagine, we are primarily a transfer institution, at least if you look at the stats. And so it's, it's important. We'll be reaching out to some of you to see if you can serve. Service is also one of our main goals here. Faculty contribute by virtue of their excellence in teaching. They contribute because of their research and their scholarship. They contribute through service. Service is important. Service to this campus, to your department, co-curricular, to the college at large, through governance. And for those of you who are new, please, please get involved. Governance, we formally define it through our, our bodies. But governance means an active participation in the decision-making process as it occurs at every level. So you don't have to be a member of one of the formal governance groups or executive committees to really contribute to governance. That's important. So, and it's needed because the other thing we have facing us is our periodic review. Colleges receive accreditation from regional bodies. We are under the Middle States uh, Commission. It is uh, a very important act, uh, process. What we do is we study ourselves. We are candid in assessing our strengths. Hopefully, we're candid in identifying our weaknesses and how we're going to go forward. The periodic review is the five-year mark, if you will, the halfway mark in, in accreditation, reaccreditation. Our last uh, middle states, the full review, we had to complete a monitoring report because we were, in the eyes of the commission, deficient in assessment and continuous improvement. This is uh, the essentially assessment, what are students learning, how do you, what do you want them to learn, what are they learning, and, and how do you know if they're learning it. This is squarely residing, of course, with faculty in how they assess 
learning in their individual classes and through their department decisions. This is a huge, huge process. It's not something that you can do the last couple of months and backdate things. So periodic review is going to be launched this year. It is very difficult um, to make sure that we have included all the things we need to include, that they are there. You must have documentation, as I said. So we have co-leaders of periodic review. Arthur Corradetti will lead it on behalf of the administration. But we're going to have a faculty co-chair. And then we will have a team, a small team, of faculty administrators to support this self-study. This will be launched this semester. It will continue. The report itself is due in 2014. But this is not something you do at the last minute, because you're supposed to be doing it all along, evaluating what's happening in student learning in particular. There is a role, obviously, for administration. They want to make sure that we have proper financial controls, et cetera, et cetera. But the heart of periodic review, the heart of reaccreditation, is the assessment of student learning outcomes. Now, thank God we have a pretty strong foundation, but this is important. It, it's a task, and it's a huge responsibility. And I thank Artie for taking it on. And I want to thank one of our faculty members who will be co-leading it. And Professor Birdie, Glenn Birdie from business. I'm not sure if Glenn is here. Glenn will co-lead co this effort. I am so deeply appreciative, because it's an enormous service to all of us. I want to thank the colleagues in the business department for allowing him to do this with us, because it will obviously create a hole in your heart a little bit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fallick, too, for supporting it. It is uh, enormous. We will all have an opportunity to contribute to it. And please do. Please do. That's a form of governance. That's a form of governance to get involved. Please, please get involved. For those of you who are new, I have to tell you, and I've said this to students when I met with the students, we don't always agree on everything. This is, this is I mean, I'm talking about wonderful things, but there are things that, that are very difficult. We don't always agree, and that's fine. But we always keep talking. And for those of you who are watching some things you know, from the perimeter, it is, um, it is done among colleagues uh, who have worked together for a long time. And there's, there's a, an, a foundation of respect that exists even when we don't agree with everything. That's important. And I think the new faculty should understand that. This is a lively, lively community. We have very amazing dialogue. And again, the important thing is that we just keep talking. Just keep talking with one another. And we get through kind of almost everything. So I anticipate that we're going to do very well in so many other things. So that's the periodic re review and uh, very, very important. And again, you'll see some information coming up through the uh, emails, et cetera. We'll try to keep everybody informed as to what's going on. Um, we have a number of upcoming events. Uh, the college, the Office of Sponsored Programs, is offering workshops on the PSC CUNY grants. By the last few years, I think Queensborough has kind of led with 40 to 45 awards. The PSC CUNY grants are really have launched so many initiatives. And our uh, Office of Sponsored Programs is offering workshops on how to, you know, construct uh, an application to maximize the chance of getting accepted. So please, uh, they've sent out information. They'll have a number of <coughs> workshops and take advantage of it. Another thing this semester we will have is our, it's interesting, we did a, a degree completion day last, last fall. This was done through Phi Theta Kappa with uh, work uh, association with the student government leaders, with the student affairs department. This year, uh, the, uh, statewide, SUNY and CUNY are partnering on the Community College Completion Day. This is where students are invited to become more aware of why it's important to finish your degree at a community college and go on. October 3, October 3, in this room during club hours, it will be our celebration. And last year, almost 100 students you know, signed their pledge to complete their degrees. It's a wonderful event. Uh, Dr. Tai, Dr. Savornos worked very hard on this with student affairs. The student government was very, very involved last year, and I assume they will as, be as well this year. It is Im very, very important. We bring back recent alums who tell about their experiences. And it was amazing last year. There were, I think, like a dozen who came here, told their stories. And they weren't 
scripted, rehearsed. We didn't know what they were going to say. Thank God nobody had an empty chair next to him. But <laughs> it, <laughs> they, what, the, what echoed through all, all of those presentations was the way they were touched by people at Queensboro, their faculty and the staff, the support staff, they, every single one of them said it just made a difference. And I think that's what we do exceptionally well as a community. We notice people. And, when, and, and that, sometimes that's all it takes for a student to really reclaim um, a, a wonderful life. And I, again, I think it's a tribute to our faculty and all of our support support staff. So I hope you'll encourage students to come to hear about why they should finish their degree. It is, is very, very important. Uh, we also, as you know, have the Common Book, uh, the Common Read Book Club, and this year it's uh, on the uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta Locks. I read it over the summer because I knew we were going to do it. It's amazing. It's led by uh, Susan Madeira and Michelle Cuomo. It promotes um, integrative learning across the curriculum and involves our faculty on a voluntary basis, students, members of the high school faculties, et cetera. It's, I, it's very important, and it, certainly the lessons in that book and the, and the topics and themes in that book are amazing. So I, I encourage you to look for that. And of course, we have our annual celebration of service. There are people who are here 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and Dinah, yes, I know, you're approaching your 50th, she wrote me a note. Uh, we celebrate the, the faculty and the staff who are at those milestones in, in October, and this is October 18th. I hope you'll, again, join to celebrate your faculty and staff. It's wonderful. Right now, I'd like uh, to bring up the, uh, Professor Alex Tarasco to tell us about the fall uh, faculty meeting and our newly revised governance plan. I would just like to welcome everyone back and hope that you have a wonderful semester. And I would just like to say uh, thank you to uh, President Call for all the innovations in our environment. I happen to think that environment is extremely important in education, where we sit in the classrooms, the campus that we walk through, uh, where we eat our bathrooms, I mean, all of that really contribute to an environment that's conducive to learning. So I'm very excited about this whole project that uh, will be coming up in the future. Um, I would like to report uh, to all of you that the state of our governance on our campus is strong. Uh, we have actively active, committed groups of faculty on this campus in the Faculty Executive Committee, many of us are here, the Academic Senate Steering Committee, the Chairs, the PSC, the CLTs, the Academic Senators, all of those faculty and HEOs participating on so many committees of this college. It's really amazing. I'd like to introduce you to some members of the FEC, which I'm the elected chair. Uh, some of the roles have recently changed on our committee, and I'd like to share that with you. Uh, Vilma Fletcher Anthony, where are you? She is now our secretary. <laughs> she replaces Phil Pecorino. And she also uh, represents the faculty on the Student Tech V Committee that has some input on how all, those, uh, all that tech money is being spent. Uh, Nathan Chow continues to be our treasurer. I don't think he's here today. Um, but you will be hearing from him. He will be sending out emails. I think those of you who have been around know the $10 faculty dues are coming up. And we hope that you respond quickly. This helps to, uh, to pay for the luncheons that we have at our faculty meetings. So please look out for that. Uh, Phil Pecorino was not able to be here, but he is now our 
election liaison working with Bell Birchfield to facilitate our electronic voting, and he's also our parliamentarian on our committee. Uh, Anthony Colius, I know, is here. Where are you? And he has been inputting our minutes and re relevant documents onto our governance website. In fact, he just recently posted our newly revised governance plan, and it's very easy to get to. You go to faculty and staff, click on governance, and the governance plan pops up as a PDF document, so I invite you to look at that. Uh, Joe Bertarelli, I know, is here. Joe? Joe is uh, replacing Anthony Colios as the faculty representative on the college's budget advisory committee. A very important committee because it has uh, some input on how money is being allocated on our campus. He also chairs the Senate Gen Ed Committee. Uh, Anne-Marie Barbone is officially retiring in November, so we will have a vacancy on the faculty exec committee. Please consider running for this important position. The uh, nominating ballots will be going out in November, so please look out for those. We are very proud to say that our revised governance plan was approved by the Board of Trustees this summer. Uh, many of us have been involved in that. Uh, this has been a project that we worked on diligently over more than a year and required the vetting of many of the constituents of this college, including, besides the FEC, the Academic Senate Steering Committee, the chairs, the student government, the Senate, and the president and administration. And for those of you who don't know the history of the governance plan, it was written in 1976. And it has uh, really not been changed much in that time until the present. It had a couple of revisions since then. Uh, the only faculty who are still here on this campus who originally were involved in the writing of that document was Paul Weiss and Nathan Chow. So this was a major undertaking. undertaking. Uh, the faculty voted overwhelmingly to adopt this plan, but we also needed the support of our president in order to move it forward. Our president, Diane Call, provided that support, and we're very grateful for that. And it was approved by the Board of Trustees on June 25th. We're now working with the Senate Steering Committee on our faculty and Senate bylaws to make them congruent with our new governance plan. And on, so on November 7th, we will have our fall faculty meeting, and the faculty will be asked to vote on the revised faculty bylaws. We urge you to attend. We need a majority of faculty to vote in a positive way to approve this, um, these changes. So you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in the future. Also at this meeting on November 7th, uh, we plan on presenting some helpful information concerning reappointment, tenure, and promotion, which many of you uh, are concerned about. There were several changes in the governance plan. Some of it was just updating the language, changing the manner in which elections were conducted, lowering the numbers of signatures required to be nominated for our committees, uh, creating better representation on the Academic Review Committee. But there were a couple of very significant changes that were made. One was making participation and governance more inclusive. PO's now participate in matters of the Academic Senate. Lecturers, instructors, and CLTs no longer have to wait for a third year reappointment in order to vote on campus elections. And for the first time, full-time lecturers and instructors can vote in their department elections. Secondly, the language concerning the powers of the Senate 
was strengthened. Besides empowering the Academic Senate as the policy-making body of the college, we added that the Senate shall have the power to recommend to the Board of Trustees the creation, deletion, or restructuring of departments of the college in consultation with the departments in question. And that strengthens the power of the Senate. Lastly, I would like to comment on our governance process here on this campus. The leadership in governance works very closely together and is committed to protecting the rights and academic freedom of the faculty and to maintain the integrity of the education that we provide. We also work closely with administration. I'd like to echo what President Cole just said, that we don't always agree, but the lines of communication remain open, and we make every attempt to come up with intelligent solutions. That's the difference between our campus and many other campuses within CUNY. And I can tell you, uh, Emily Ty and Phil Pecorino and I, we sit on the CUNY-wide Faculty Governance Leaders Committee. And we hear stories about what's going on in other campuses with the pathways and with different initiatives. And I have to say that we are very fortunate on this campus to have a president who has been respectful of our governance process, as have been her predecessors um, on this campus. Um, I think we have an environment that fosters communication and collaboration. So as we continue to work on the challenges ahead, and there will be many, we count on her to continue to be mindful of our governance process and to maintain those open lines of communication. And I hope to see you faculty on November 17th. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tarasco, and I can't really uh, understate the accomplishment of the revision of the governance plan, which took months and months and months of the time of our faculty executive committee and colleagues on the Senate Steering Committee and many others, so congratulations on that. There is some uh, great news to report and some interesting news to report in terms of the update of the freshman academies and, generally speaking, um, the high impact activities. So Elizabeth Lachner and Victor uh, Fischera, please come on up. I would like to thank uh, President Cole for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, I would like to just say a few words about uh, the fact book that we recently produced. As many of you know, uh, well, welcome to the new uh, members here uh, on campus. My name is Elizabeth Lackner. I'm the Director of Institutional Research. And uh, those of you who are not new, you probably know we are uh, on the third floor of the administration building in room 5, uh, 315. Uh, and we all, all what we do all day long is looking at numbers, crunching away. And uh, so I would like to point out that our work is not completed until what we find is communicated to you and implemented and used in practice. And we're very happy to support faculty and staff in that endeavor. So I just want to say a few words about the latest fact book before uh, Victor will go into details about our findings. Okay. So, this is how our uh, latest fact book looks like. Basically, uh, the fact book, as the word says, is a book with facts, uh, but it's a great resource for the entire college community. It includes trends, enrollment trends, academic performance, progress, information, 
information on student demographics, financial data, personnel data. It's really a resource and a profile of our institution and uh, it can be used in, in a variety of ways. For once, it's good for you to know what kind of school you're working at, so you might find it useful. Faculty who are interested in applying for grants might find it useful uh, if proposals call for information on enrollment history, student demographics, retention data, it's in the fact book. People who work with outside constituencies, uh, let's say a reporter from the New York Times calls up and says, well, we know Queens is the most diverse county in the nation. Does your student body reflect that? Well, it's in the fact book. Academic planning, fiscal, and facilities planning obviously can use the fact book to look at enrollment trends, where are our areas of growth, where do we have to be concerned. Uh, so in that uh, instance, you might want to look at the fact book for historical data that's also there. How do you get a hold of the fact book? Well, you go to our website, it's the main URL with forward slash our abbreviation Office of Institutional Research and Assessment and you will find it there. There's two ways you can work with the fact book. There's a link right here. You can either download the entire book as a PDF, keep it on your computer, print it out, or you can browse through the different chapters. So again, for example, if that reporter keeps bugging you about what our student body looks like, you can go to student demographics. Every chapter um, starts with the summary of the findings of the particular area. And then you can browse through and see right here, it might be a little small for you to see, our students come from 129 different countries, speak 99 different languages. Okay. So, this is how you can get a hold of the fact book. Okay, just want to um, see if I can highlight a few findings. Real quick, uh, fall 2011 was the peak of our enrollment with 16,837 students who've never been that big. Uh, and uh, this fall, as President alluded to, uh, we'll, we are not as big. Uh, because we have to watch our enrollment. Um, students come from 129 different countries. Our retention rate went up, uh, meaning first time, full time freshmen who started in fall 2010 have come back. 72.1% of them have come back in fall 11. We don't know the new numbers yet because census date is not there yet, but we're watching that retention rate really carefully. And the very good news is that I would like to share with you that uh, the underrepresented minorities uh, retained at higher rates than in previous years. And we'll show a little graph in, in, in a little while. Just uh, for new folks, uh, might be very interesting to know our largest uh, programs are liberal arts and sciences with over 5,000 students business administration, criminal justice, health sciences, liberal arts and science with the science focus, almost 1,100 students as well. Areas of strong growth is health sciences, STEM, which is a collection of programs in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, has grown by 77% uh, in the last five years which is great, it's something that the nation is looking at and there's a lot of research activity in, in this area as well. Liberal arts, of course, is our biggest uh, area and transfer degree area. Liberal and, uh, sorry, visual and performing arts has grown 
quite significantly as well, 42% in the last five years. Many of you know that we are a very diverse campus. There's an almost equal representation of the major uh, ethnic groups here on campus. 27% Hispanic, 26% black, 24% white, and 23% uh, Asian, which is very unique for a large community college like ours. Again, QCC serves the world. 129 different countries represented among our students. Top 10 countries are the US, China, Jamaica, Guyana, South Korea, Colombia, India, Trinidad, Haiti, and Bangladesh. They speak 99 different languages. Top um, non-English languages are Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Bengali, and Russian. 32% were born outside the US and 39% speak a language other than English at home, which is quite significant. Okay, now I just want to spread <clears throat> a little bit of good news that uh, is something that is being monitored CUNY-wide and we are very happy to report, which is that uh, the gap, retention gap between minorities underrepresented student groups and non-underrepresented groups, that gap has narrowed. So if you are, if you started in fall 2005, you're first time full-time freshman, and you were Asian or white, your group was retained by 69.9%. If you were in the underrepresented group, uh, you came back, only 58.3% came back. So this, has, this gap has changed over the years. As you can see in the orange line right here, we had a difference of 11.6% a couple of years ago, and it's now down to 5.7%, which is really a great achievement. Not only did our retention go up in general, but the gap between those groups narrowed, which is a wonderful story. Many of you have heard that uh, women do slightly better in education than men. Uh, well, so that's also something that is monitored CUNY-wide. It's a, it's a, the gap is not so, uh, so uh, extensive and has fluctuated over the years here at QCC, but we're monitoring as well. So it's been going up and down. It's uh, right now around 3%. Um, so that's something uh, of interest as well. And uh, that's really all I am here to say. Just a few more bullet points what we're focusing on right now. Um, we really would like to know where our students go after they leave us. How many of those who drop out uh, go to other institutions of higher education, either community college or senior colleges? And how many of our graduates um, move on to senior colleges? So we sp we'll spend a lot more effort to analyze this. Remediation efforts, big topic. Uh, we're spending a lot of time to analyze a uh, student coming in with different remedial needs. Uh, how do they do in the long haul here at QCC? What's their progress? What's their academic career? Um, we're currently benchmarking ourselves against other community college nationwide, and that's something that we would like to better understand. And uh, we're hoping to have time to analyze more uh, how students feel here on campus, student satisfaction, and uh, get more student feedback. So those are some of the areas uh, we are concentrating, in addition to what we're already doing, and some of those findings will be in the new fact book uh, that will hopefully be published early in the spring. So uh, this is just a few things that I would like to highlight about the fact book. So I really encourage all of you uh, to go online and uh, print out the fact book or look at, at the findings and I'm sure you will find uh, some things that are useful to you 
interesting and hopefully uh, you can implement some of our findings or if you need additional information, we're here for you to serve you so you can serve students better. So I would like now to uh, hand the microphone to my colleague, Victor. He will tell you some more about the freshman academies and our high impact activities on, in the classrooms and how they really help students improve academic progress. Thank you. Welcome back. This morning, um, I would like to share with you uh, some of the latest findings from my research investigating the effectiveness of the freshman academies. But first, I'd like to just very briefly go over the very basics of the academies and what my research is all about. Academies provide, since fall of 2009, all first-time, full-time freshmen become a member of one of six academies. That's the structure that's provided. So if you're interested in nursing, you would be in, for example, the Health Sciences Academy. Each academy has a center, has a freshman coordinator. The freshman coordinators are an important component. They are the main go-to person for the students in the academies. They're the people who help them through the rough spots. We also have high-impact practices. The freshman coordinators actually help to register the students for courses which have high-impact practices. These practices have been shown in the pedagogical research literature to improve our students' ability to do well in their classes and to also um, persist and stay through motivation, engagement, and making the courses much more rich. So these are the three basic components of the academies, which should, according to the protocol that I follow, has expectations that our students will perform better in multiple ways. Um, just basically our basic um, high impact strategies. We have ePortfolio, Cornerstone courses, learning communities, service learning, writing intensive courses. I'll go into detail about some of them later. And we also have one that's not part of the protocol called SWIG, Student Wiki Interdisciplinary Group, which I'll speak about later, which is another way that we help motivate and engage our students. According to the protocol, we have various ways that we measure our success. Course success rates, retention rates, higher degree attainment rates, in other words, graduation rates. These are the ones that I'll be focusing on primarily today. Um, usually I um, talk about uh, components of what lead up to graduation, but today I'm going to reverse things. I'm going to talk about graduation first and kind of work my way backwards. I figure it's better to think a little bit out of the box. It's, it's kind of easy for me to think out of the box. My parents once told me that when the stork delivered me, I came with a note and it said, one baby, box not included, good luck. So. I figure it's more interesting to see what might have improved our students' ability to graduate rather than, you know, so I'm going to go a little bit backwards. So graduation, retention, and then high impact strategies. So here it is, the three year graduation rate. This is preliminary. It's almost settled, just a little bit of the um, August happenings that have to be settled for me to have final rates, but this is pretty close to what it's going to be. As with the protocol, we always compare the 06 baseline comparison cohort to the first freshman academy cohort, and I'll be looking at the 2010 cohort more in the future. But for now, we have these two for a three-year rate, 12% for the uh, previous cohort, 17.2% for the academy cohort. So this is pretty much in line with the expectations of the freshman academy protocol that due to whatever is happening with the academies, there would be, in this confluence of factors, we would have um, a net bottom line ultimate result, which was an improvement in the graduation rate. This is about 34%. Uh, improvement from 2006. So really pleased about that. And as, as Lou had spoke about earlier, um, the university is very concerned about, nationally we're concerned about performance gaps between gender and ethnicity. So I said, you know what, I should break this down and get a look and to see um, how it works. Sorry, I just want to backtrack for a second. Didn't get to gender yet. This is just another perspective on graduation rates. Here's 2009. The protocol says compare 06 to 09, but I'd like to just look at the big broad picture. These are all first time full time students starting in 2001 cohort. You can see where our rates are, 13, 15, 12, 13, 12. You can see how 17.2 really bumps up. So that's just yet another perspective on what's happening with changes in our graduation rate, the three-year three -year rate. So back to gender. I wanted to take a look what's happening with gender gap. I broke down that three-year rate, remember 17.2, into men and women. So of the first time full-time freshman, fall 2009, of the women, almost 20% graduated. Of the men, 14%. So you do see we have 
um, a gender gap here in performance. This is, again, the national trend. Um, ethnicity is important to look at also. And we have our various groupings here. And again, we do see with um, the underrepresented minority groups, 12, 13%. Again, 17 is the whole group. And with, you see with uh, white and Asian, higher rates. So again, we see evidence of a performance gap. Um, just note, with this category, the ends a bit too small to draw conclusions. But I have that category there anyway. Now, to try to get a bit more of a broad pers perspective on this, um, I have this rather complex table, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. You've seen part of it already. Here's all, 17.2. Here's our comparison. And here's that percentage change comparison group. We've seen these already with minority group and with gender. And now here we have 06. So we can compare and see on 06, for example, men 9.6% graduation rate, 14. You could, looking across, you could see pretty much everybody improved. I'll give you a moment to, to absorb this. Among all the Gula groups, 06 to 09, by comparison, we see improvement. Now here's the fun part. Let's look at the percentage change, how the improvement rate has gone. What's that percentage change? So I have in purple here where you see really tremendous improvements. So you see with men, 9.6 to 14.5. It's a 51% improvement. Black, 57% improvement. Large changes. So just looking at the gender performance gap that we have here compared to 06, this gap is narrowing. Both did well, but with men at an accelerated rate. So this is showing changes now over time, and which is also some pretty good news. We have a mixed story among ethnicities, because you can see with the Hispanic group, they improved, but at a slower rate. And the white group improved, so that you know, changes, it widens the gap when you have that factor. So it's a mixed bag, though in general, everyone did improve. Um, you know, if students graduate, why? At a most broad level, well, they're earning credits at a faster pace and they're staying. I mean, they have to stay. So we look at retention. See, I'm kind of working backwards here. So the, to answer part of the question, what may be causing a higher graduation rate? Well, in part, retention really helps that they're staying. Here's the 09 cohort. Half year retention, one year rate. Again, comparison to the baseline rate, 82.65. We have 88.71, a really large increase. And when you look nationally, you usually don't see numbers bump up like this. So we're, we're really doing well. What I'm really most pleased about is the next cohort, 2010. Are the academies still continuing to have some benefit? And the 10 cohort, fairly strong, not as strong, but more importantly, in one year, they're still holding in there. A really great retention rate for one year. Nationally, we saw some numbers of comparison groups with iPads. It was like 64 to 66%. So you know, it's good to see numbers like this for one-year retention rates. So you have retention. And then it brings the question, all right, you know, they're graduating because they're staying. They're staying. Well, why are they staying? And part of that, it's high-impact practices. The research literature shows that high-impact high practices really engage our students, motivate our students and it makes it more likely for them to stay. And also, to a degree, they're more likely to perform well in their classes. And finally, I have a lot more um, findings because I've had time. I have five semesters that I've looked at. I've aggregated those results. So I looked at starting fall 09 um, for our first cohort. And I took you know, spring 10, fall 10, spring 11, fall 11. Those five semesters aggregated courses together. Using um, a C or higher as my standard for a pass rate, I'm following mostly university methodology. It's pretty strong. Um, looking only at completers only. So this is people who score between an A and an F, not those who leave, just so you know what my results are coming up to look like. Um, groupings of high impact strategies we find um, in the literature and, and by previous findings, if students experience more than one high impact within a semester, within a course or a semester, they tend to do better. So I grouped my findings in terms of that. And um, all these comparisons are made with students who are in no high impact experience sections of courses. So um, I'm going to talk about one of the courses in particular, Critical One Math 10. But first, I just want to give basic definition with learning communities for you all to read to get it, um, the concept. Kind of to put it in a nutshell, and, and I dare oversimplify a little bit, part of the motivation, the power between, behind learning communities, there's a social emotional quality. When you have students and they work together and they get to know each other, bonds form, friendships form, study groups form. Research shows how important that is and how it leads to students becoming more engaged, more motivated. That's a component of what happens with learning communities. It also solves, serves a cognitive end because material is repeated in a way. You have common themes, and repetition is a key part to learning. And it's done, of course, in an interesting fashion, not rote. So I can see cognitively, you know, in a social emotional level, our students can benefit 
and be more engaged through learning communities. Math 10, one of our most critical courses, remedial algebra, needed to get into the credit bearing courses. They, um, for those five semesters, they had sections that had learning communities and those without learning communities. Pass rate, 46% versus 35%. Tremendous difference. Um, so there's some evidence there. Actually, this is consistent with what MDRC found within the Math 10, that there was success there. In the long run, things were a bit more mixed in the results, but in the short run, within Math 10, they had found before my sample that um, learning communities really seem to work with helping our students in Math 10 to pass the course. Another area, uh, high impact, that I keep finding themes popping up over and over again is service learning. Here's our definition. Bring students out into the real world instead of just simply having, you know, textbook classroom lecture. It, it enriches the, the whole experience because now they're doing things for real. They're seeing real people. They're applying what they learn. And there's a great component of reflection within that which really engages the mind. Again, a cognitive factor. Service learning really makes their experiences more poignant. I mean, you hear the you probably the videos and what you've seen before with students attesting and saying, oh, I was scared. I don't think I can handle this. I don't know if I could really interview somebody. And they worry. And then they do it. And afterwards, they're transformed. They build self-efficacy. They say, wow, I did it. And they think of everything differently that way. That's part of the power behind service learning. Um, I'd like to thank Joe Pantaleo, Arlene Kemmerer, Alana Zinger um, for letting me work with them on their research project involving service learning. It was really fantastic. It was a beautiful design. You are pretty much holding Professor Constant. It, for three semesters, um, there was BE 122, Remedial Reading, and a Health of Nations course taught. And there were sections that they, they taught with service learning and without, and took a look at um, retention rates. And it was amazing that over those three semesters, those without the service learning, same professor, 62.5%. Those with service learning, 75% retention rate. These are tremendous differences in retention. And this is half year retention rates. So I'm really pleased to see this type of a finding showing the linkage between service learning experiences and half year retention rates. One of the most critical courses of all, um, English 101, it's needed for students to take many other courses. And, um, and of course, many of our students take it, so I have a nice big sample size to work with. Again, five semesters worth looking at. C or higher is my pass rate. Conditions of students who took English 101 without high impacts, service learning, learning communities, e-portfolio, student wiki interdisciplinary group, high impact. And then I kind of had categories of students who experienced, these are students, um, numbers of students in this row here, one, two, or three or more high impacts. So I broke it down that way. Just realize that this means, for example, that students had an element of service learning. They may have had SL, service learning, and ePortfolio. I didn't tease it out that way to kind of keep things simple. So this means an element of service learning was experienced, an element of ePortfolio. ePortfolio and SWIG very often come together. So you can see similarities here. But bottom line, no, English, um, no high impacts with English 101, 83% pass rate. Service learning, 87. Learning communities, 88, 90. SWIG 92, consistent with previous studies about SWIG and English 101, really powerful effect on pass rates. And for students who've had one, two, or three more high impacts, another way of looking at it, um, we have strong pass rates here. So here's an association between high impact strategies in a critical course with all different types of high impacts and combinations of them showing um, some improvements with the um, pass rates. Just a bit more detail, the student wiki interdisciplinary group. This is a really unique, special type of high impact strategy. It's extremely rich. We have virtual learning experiences, learning communities. You're probably many of you familiar with that, that evil group on Wikipedia. This is the non evil type of you know, Wikipedia experience. Your, your wiki, your, the students are actually sharing their work together. They'll post some of their essays in their writing, and someone else will gift them. They'll post like a table or chart. This could also be audio visual, and they'll comment, and they'll, or a table might enhance what someone else said in writing, and it'll comment and write. So there's all this interaction happening in an electronic media, and this is what the 21st century is about with the younger generation, very motivating. So we have technology enhanced, integrated experiences, virtual learning communities, multiple high impacts. Common intellectual experience, reflection also goes on within SWIG. So it's a very rich, multiple high impact type of high impact experience. Um, just wanted to give some background on that because we keep seeing a theme where the students who were in the SWIG groups seem to have stronger um, results in passing. And in my previous presentations, I spoke about retention rates with um, the SWIG groups. Here we have psychology, um, 510. 
And there was no service learning with that group. That's why you won't see that one included here. But we had writing intensive learning communities. Every student who had SWIG also had ePortfolio. Everyone who had e So that's why you see the numbers match up here. I put it in one column, one, two, and three high impacts. Tremendous difference. Those who had no high impacts, 58% pass rates. And these are large numbers, too, as you can see. You know, we're dealing with real meaningful sample sizes, <coughs> happy to say, finally. So 70%, 68%. SWIG again, 80%. And different quantities, uh, one, two, or three or more high impacts. And a very broad category, first, basically no high impacts versus one or more. 58, 68, and you can see more high impacts, um, greater pass rates. So it's really fantastic that I'm finally able to see it with large sample sizes, many, many, many students, different perspectives, and with different types of courses. So in the future, um, we'll be looking more at the 09 cohort. Now that we have three-year graduation, many of them are moving on. So what happens afterwards? Let's see if we can try to track them, see what happens after they've graduated. Um, and also, if they don't graduate, they may transfer, which is also, in many cases, a beneficial outcome. Um, outcomes of the fall of nine, 10 cohort, it's the next group to look at. I'll be looking at their two-year graduation rates, retention, all the other things. Credit completion, investigating other courses that employ high impacts. I want to really cover all of them. Ultimately, maybe have one big matrix showing all the effects for all the courses. And we'll be having a new Freshman Academy Experience Survey, which will help us see some of the impact that our freshman coordinators have. And also, we'll provide feedback to the freshman coordinators so they'll see what they could work on, what's working well. So it's a really great device in multiple ways. So that's pretty much the basics. Um, have time for questions? I thank, thank you, you for that. I do. We've invested heavily in the concept of freshman academies. And I think we're beginning to see impact. I think it's very gratifying that faculty who have worked in so many of the areas for the high impact activities, and of course the freshman coordinators, the faculty coordinators, have been really uh, amazing. So thank you for that. Dr. Arthur Corradetti, Dr. Lorena Ellis are going to give us an update on the implementation of Pathways so far on the campus. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellis and I wanted to give you an update on how Pathways is going. This is something that we've been involved in for a number of months now, and uh, it will continue through the next year or so. The launch of the Pathways Common Core at, and the new curricula that are associated with it will be in fall 2013. And so we're currently in a process of looking at the academic side, um, proposing a common core, and then revising our curricula. And then we'll be, of course, changing a lot of the systems that we use. Courses have to be coded and scribed and CUNY first. We have to change all of our advisement practices. We have to change the college catalog, the website. It's really quite a massive effort. But what we wanted to do today is we wanted to give you a, an update on where we are right now. And one way that we wanted to do, the way we wanted to do that was to use the website that we've developed. So this is the Pathways website. It's under academics. It's also under faculty and staff. Click on Pathways, and this screen pops up. What we have on it is the Common Core course submission table which is being considered by the campus. Nothing has been uh, approved on the campus yet. We have the STEM variant course table, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And we have the curricular changes to degree programs that are currently under consideration. At the bottom is the plan that was submitted last year that we're following pretty closely. 
And to the right, you have a number of resources that you might find useful. What I just wanted to say before we proceed and look more closely at each element on the website is that Academic Affairs will be a, a hosting a campus conversation on Monday, September 24, at 3 o'clock, 3 to 5, in the Oakland Dining Room. On Pathways will be an opportunity for the campus to get together and talk at greater length about Pathways and its implications. So everyone will be invited. There'll be a, uh, an announcement about this forthcoming. For now, however, here is the list of courses that have been submitted by the departments to curriculum. No courses have been approved by curriculum. No courses have been approved by the Senate. These are currently the submissions to the curriculum committee at this point. And before I turn it over to Dr. Ellis, I just wanted to give you a little context. We submitted 101 courses, these courses, courses that uh, have not been revised or that are not new to the review committees. And to give you some context, as I said, uh, about 600 courses have been submitted CUNY-wide, and under 100 have been approved to this point, 10 of which are ours. So there's a long way to go. The total that the, the university anticipates is between 17 and 1,800 courses that are going to have to be reviewed. So we're not even a third of, about a third of the way. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I just want to point out to you that in this same page that we have here, uh, at the bottom of it, you can find the description of the categories, and then also the total numbers. And this list is constantly changing. We are more courses are being sent to the curriculum committee. So you can keep an eye on the changes. And also on the top right, you can download the form for submissions. And uh, you will recognize some of these courses, but others you won't because courses have been changing their prefixes. And here we have a mixture of old and new prefixes. But when you go into the categories, the top line you will see always the category and the total number of the courses in the category. But also right on next to the name of the, ca of the course, there is a Adobe icon. If you click on that icon, we uploaded all the submission forms with the syllabus that touched at the bottom. You can see. So you can look inside and see the courses there. You, we try to keep the old name and the new name in that form so you will recognize the courses. But most of them will be changing into the new prefixes as they are approved by the Senate. Where to go? Go ahead. If you all received, I mean, you all received it, but I don't know if you all read Dr. Pecorino's report to the Senate for next Tuesday, you will recognize a lot of these courses are on the agenda as new courses or revised courses. So make sure all the Senates look at what's up there and what's in Dr. Pecorino's email so that you will know what you will be voting on ahead of time because there are many new courses there. This is for this Tuesday. But most probably for next month, the Senate will have a lot of these submissions for approval. So we had put up these courses already in June so that all faculty could look at them during the summer. And you received an email from President Call at the beginning of July warning you about this. And also, again, a couple a week ago, DP still sent it out again. So there's a lot to be looked at, and we urge you to do that as soon as you can, because there is a lot to be approved, and last minute you don't have the time to do it. So, uh, so turn to the STEM. Yeah, and uh, we want to mention there is one glitch that you might encounter if you go to this site. If you use the Internet Explorer, the latest version, it, uh, if you click on that, click on it from the second one to see. See, when you click on the second one where it says, 
approved by the Senate, it should be empty. And the next one where it says approved for, by the uh, review committee, it should be empty at this point because we don't have the, the official version yet. As soon as we get it, as soon as something is approved by the Senate, we will populate those two. But there is one internet browser version when you open and you click, nothing changes, and you suddenly think, oh, everything is approved, but that's the browser. So right now we suggest you use Firefox if you get that problem. It, it doesn't happen on all the computers. It, it happens on his, but not on mine, so it varies from that version. And I think now uh, you're gonna talk a little bit yes. about the STEM variant. So this is the proposed Common Core, 30 credit Common Core. It's under consideration. The Curriculum Committee will be forwarding courses to the Senate for approval at some point, and the college will be voting on uh, the core. Courses in each category will be courses that students will have a choice to satisfy that category. And you know, presumably there will be some changes over the next few weeks. But this is currently what is to be considered, and I'll, I'll just echo what Dr. Ellis has said. We encourage you to take a look at these. You could look at every one if you wish. You can look at the form. You could look at how they're going to satisfy the learning outcomes. You could look at the current syllabus. And uh, it, this will help to inform your decision. There are also STEM variants. These are uh, math and science courses that are currently on the books. No changes have occurred. They're not three hours, three credits. They are four credits, four hours, or even more. They are current courses that are in the, that are STEM and that are uh, that that meet requirements in STEM and STEM-related degree programs. These courses, uh, we've this list we've submitted. This is something you could take a look at on your own. There are 24 of them, and this list has been submitted to the CUNY OAA office for review and approval. These are courses that will be on our will remain in our current degree programs, and they are variants because they're not three hours, three credits. And they're also variants because they are the only courses that will appear, they might, about 15 of them, duplicate in different categories, in two categories. So not all 25, but I think it's yes. 14, right? And you'll see they're grouped, each is, is uh, grouped around which category, so beginning with 1B, which is mathematics and quantitative reasoning. These are the courses that would satisfy that category and then so on, 1C and 2E. And you can see, as Dr. Ellis has said, sometimes there is duplication, and because they are a variant, that is allowed. Finally, we've had a number of... Yeah. yeah. I think if a course is on that list, A, B, K, a student could take those courses They will be in the Common Core, yeah. exactly. Okay. On the curricular changes pages, these are the uh, curricular changes that have been submitted to the Senate at this point. More will come because all of our current programs will have to be reconfigured to a, path, a pathways paradigm. In the case of the AA and AS programs, there is a 30 credit Common Core. And in the AAS programs, there are presumably 21 or 22 credits that will be uh, common core courses and will be courses that will be in that list that I showed you at the beginning, the proposed list. But the difference, of course, is, is that there won't be 30 credits of common core for the AAS, only about a third of the 60 total credits. These are the ones that have been proposed. And the one thing that I wanted to point out, which is a major change, that has occurred. Some good comes of some things. We have a whole set of concentrations that are being proposed for the LA-1 program. This is a major departure from past practice. The LA-1 has been a standard program in our curricula for probably since the inception of the college. 
And this is our basic transfer program. In many cases, it is considered by students to be a kind of undecided curriculum. I know I want to transfer, but I don't know what I want to concentrate in yet or I want to do. Um, we don't have majors, per se. But the fact of the matter is, is that if students have interest in any one of these concentrations, they could take a kind of LA-1 modified that will be tailored to their interests. And this could be uh, instrumental in providing more focus and more engagement to students in LA-1, and we hope better retention and graduation rates. So as you see, there are quite a few. There are 10 of them that are being proposed. American studies, global studies, physical education, psychology, and so forth. 10 of them. And uh, this is uh, quite a departure from uh, uh, curricula in the past. So we look forward to seeing how this all uh, works out, and uh, we could wind up seeing a major change in our, career, uh, in our curricular offerings. So that kind of brings us up to date. This fall, the review committees will continue meeting. We'll be hearing from them about courses approved. If courses need revision, they'll be coming back to me. I'll be sending them back to the departments for revision, and then they'll be resubmitted after going through curricul or curricular review at curriculum committee. Uh, at this point, as I said, 11 decisions have come back of 101. 10 were approved, one has been, uh, has been sent back for revision. The revision has already been made and it's back at curriculum and we await to hear more word from the review committees. So we conclude with, what do you want to? Before we conclude, we would like to thank Academic Computer Center, Bruce's team, especially Dave Moretti for helping us set it up, design and update constantly this site. And the other thing is that we had a chance to submit, uh, that was July 13th, those 111 courses. And we have another chance, another deadline is September 14th, which is a couple of days after our September Senate. So by then, we hope to have uh, more approvals and then a uh, chance to submit more courses that will be coming from the curriculum. So we'll just uh, mention again, September 24th in Oakland at 3 o'clock. If you, we invite you to come and talk more about pathways and about the changes that are going to occur and to have some discussion. Thank you very much. I always like to think of a challenge as an opportunity. We're going to have lots of opportunities. Thank you all for, for coming today. It's really great to see you. I hope you have an amazingly effective and fun semester, and we do manage to have fun here. So again, my thanks to each and every one of you, the faculty, the HEOs, the staff, the students, thank you for being here. Have a great term.